and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Our guest today has a degree in plant molecular biology and bioinformatics from the ZMBP and the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology, Tübingen. For four years now, she's brought her comprehensive and unique knowledge in plant biology, genomics, metagenomics, transcriptomics, and machine learning to the Computomics team. And I hear she's fluent in Python. Welcome, Patricia Rika. Hi, thanks. I'm happy to be here. I'm glad you are here. Uh, just as a quick icebreaker, I, I wonder, have you watched the Hunger Games trilogy? Yes, I watched the movies, but I never read the books so far. <laughs> Same here. But I wonder, since you're an avid archer yourself, what do you think of Katniss' technique with the bow? Oh, I am absolute. I have no idea about technique. I guess she's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to aim for something and try to hit it. And very often I don't hit. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're doing it for the joy of, of the sport yeah, rather than... Absolutely, yeah. And hopefully you don't have to participate in any Hunger Games anytime soon. <laughs> oh yeah, hopefully not. That would be awful. <laughs> Yeah. Well, at the same time, in a way, you are participating in the Hunger Games, I feel like, because you are a part of the Computomics team who's working at the edge of a science that's trying to, I guess, beat hunger in a way and beat potential hunger issues in the world in the future with uh, making plant breeding better and more modern. So um, maybe we can find a twist there and, and say you are playing the Hunger Games. Okay. <laughs> um, But yeah, so so we'll we'll move to your job. You started as a bioinformatics analyst in Computomics team, but are currently the product manager for Exceed Score. Can you tell us what is Exceed Score? So at its heart, Exceed Score is a tool to predict the performance of the future varieties or varieties that are currently under development. Um, For that, we use phenotypic data. So really, how much does the plant look? How much yield does it produce? Um, we take the genotype information of these plants and also the information of where it's grown, train a machine learning model with it. And this model is then able to understand the interaction between the genetics and the environment and why it's producing a certain, for example, yield is usually the most important one, a certain yield at a certain location. And with this information, we are then able to take additional genotypes and predict how their performance would have been, which means that a breeder usually can't test everything they have in the field. It's, there's just not en enough space and money. Uh, so we fill the gaps um, to some extent. But it's also so much more than just predicting the phenotypes. It's also about understanding the breeding program and the breeder and what their vision is for their future program, basically, and to align with that and enable them to predict then also for the future and potentially even for future climates. That's like the mm -hmm. ultimate goal, basically. For sure. So if I were a breeder, which I'm not, but let's just <laughs> imagine I am, how does it work? Like, Take me through the process of I'd like to optimize what I'm doing and I'd like to enlist your help in doing so. Yes. So we usually start with that we really try to understand the breeding program of this breeder. Um, there are so many things that can differ, even if they are breeding for the same crop, but even, even more if you look at different kinds of crops and vegetables and whatever you want to breed for. So it, it's really intrinsic to understand their process of breeding, how their breeding scheme is currently mapped out. Um, then we analyze together the genetic potential they have in the populations they are using, like what kind of genetics do they have, what is their current plan for the future and the paths they would like to map out. And then we can think about where do we see potentials in the genetics they have at the moment? How would we set up ideally models that answer specific questions they have? For example, if they are looking for a variety that is very drought resistant or mm -hmm. varieties that are resistant to certain diseases, which are surely coming up, um, then we can think about where in their material do we see potential for that? How can we 
create and improve the populations for that together. And how, in the end, it's really about how do we set up the machine learning model that it is able to answer these questions. So we have to think about which um, varieties um, should be tested and where should they be tested so that the model also has, has the knowledge and the information which is needed to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then we basically go from there, have like whenever, it depends on how many cycles they do per year. If there's, for example, just one cycle, like we plant um, in spring, harvest in um, autumn, we can run predictions using those phenotypes and then it kind of develops from there on. And from that process of first contact and I guess analysis and, and mapping out the goals to you've identified promising variations, variants, how long does that usually take? So the initial one to see potential in the program is really a matter of, I guess, probably weeks of talking to each other and figuring out it out together because the technology itself is quite complex. So it also takes some time for the breeder to really understand how they could apply it. Um, but then in the end, till they actually do have these varieties that can take years because you start with a cross, that's like the initial creation of a new variation, but then you have to do all the, the whole breeding and uh, making this variety homozygous, for example, and testing it and making sure it is really exceeding what is on the market at the moment till they can basically sell it. That can take years. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you compare that method to classical methods, what's the difference in time? Because that breeding to, to get from, from that first idea to market, that's always taken a lot of time. But I take it with exceed score you can go faster than you can with classical methods, right? Yeah, so um, it depends on the program you look at. For example, with um, hybrid breeding, as it's done, for example, in the case of um, maize, mm -hmm. um, there you can apply a different breeding scheme, which actually saves you time. Um, and you can apply this other breeding scheme because of using machine learning. Um, and because it can benefit from this actually shortened kind of breeding scheme. Um, in the case of other breeding programs, we save time in terms of that we have, we can advance faster. So from one generation to the next, you are able to create, for example, more yield. And then looking at how much gain you had in a certain time, you basically create more gain in the same time. It's not necessarily saving time in terms of years but it's saving saving times time in terms of how long you need for a certain improvement mm -hmm. so if um we talked about about archery in the beginning so your hit rate is better which saves exactly. time exactly exactly okay. yeah mm -hmm. wow i mean that must be a huge factor in in how people use it but i also picked up on uh, when you said it does take time if people haven't used it before it does take time for them to to understand so maybe yeah. you can elaborate what makes machine learning different from other methods so there are very um, subtle and technical differences in the at the core of it which is um, at the moment a lot of breeders or basically all of the breeders are using statistical methods because that's what is available to them it's used already for years. They make a lot of, to apply statistical methods, you have to make a lot of simplifications to the biological problem. And machine learning doesn't need these simplifications. Um, it's also able to capture much more complex interactions. So for example, the interaction between a genotype and the temperature, uh, it's not a linear interaction, right? It's not like the higher the temperature, the more yield you get. Um, there is a certain cutoff, like at very low temperatures, it's not good. At very high temperatures, it's not good. In between, it may be a bit linear, but it's in total, it's not a linear interaction between the genetics and the temperature to create mm -hmm. a certain yield, for example. Um, and machine learning is able to capture that this is not a linear thing here and is able to predict then also nonlinear 
interactions and realize that above 30 degrees, you can basically scrap your whole field, um, but that there are maybe varieties which can even tolerate that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one very technical detail um, that you don't add more bias to your data and to the results than you already have in your data. So that's a very big thing. And because of that um, possible or ability of machine learning to capture such, such much more complex interactions, actually predicting for future climates is now within reach. I mean, that I would imagine that must be the dream of every breeder <laughs> to say like, hey, I have this variety, it has this genetics, but actually I will sell it in maybe 10 years to when the testing is done. Mm -hmm. How will this variety actually perform in the weather we have in 10 years? I mean, that's the ultimate question. Will it, will it still be better than what is on the market when we have this future weather condition? And that's something that is now within reach to do that because of machine learning. That's something you can't do with the methods that are available so far. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge game changer, like you like you said. I wonder, or I seem to recall that with uh, Exceed Score, you also work with simulation as a mm -hmm. technique. So rather than actually having to plant something to see how it performs, you can you can do that in a computer simulation. Can you explain that aspect of, of the technique as well? Yes. So um, on the one hand, we can simulate potential genotypes. So, I mean, at the very beginning of, a, of one very like breeding cycle that can take years, the initial thing a breeder does is making a new cross. And then they are, but they, I mean, they are picking a tiny amount of all this potential that is in the seed material because they can only test a few of the seeds that come out of such a cross. Mm -hmm. And then the question is after picking those and selecting those over years, which one will be actually still good? So what we do is actually simulating what genetics could come out of such a cross um, after this long process of creating then the homozygous variety, for example. Um, so we simulate these genotypes that could be at the end of this process. And then we predict for those genotypes how they would perform in the field. So this is really a glimpse into the future because th those genetics do not yet exist. We just simulate a lot of potential genetics that could come out of that and predict those um, phenotypes the phenotypes of these genetics and then the breeder can see like oh that one looks like there is not really a potential in this cross so i don't make it but there is another one which has incredibly high yield it is early maturing so i can harvest it also very early mm -hmm. that's the one i take and that's really yeah as i said it, it really gives them a glimpse into the future because none of this exists so far, they have to create it and it gives them data um, to make a data driven decision on what they want to create, actually. Right. And that is already a step into the future. What would you say where would you like to take Exceed Score next? So what we are currently working on is really to enable it to predict for future climates, because that's a very hard problem. There are so many wheels you can adjust and turn and uh, things you can improve improve so that would be the ultimate goal to be able to predict um, with a higher accuracy for future weather conditions um, and then the additional thing is to add more functionalities to it um, so at the moment we are supporting variety development programs um, for example soybean um, or barley, uh, which is you bred for brewing beer. Um, and we also uh, support maize breeding programs, which is hybrid breeding. Um, and we want to extend that to other crop varieties. There are some which you can basically immediately plug in without much adjustments, but there are a lot of crops which are just more complex from their biology their genome is more complex and things like that. And for those, we have to do some certain technical 
adjustments basically mm -hmm. um, and that would be another goal to be able to support those breeding programs with much more complex crops um, as well especially because it's a complex crop it's also complex for the breeder then to breed this crop and to give them another tool at hand so so even yeah I guess even more worthy to try and increase the hit rate, uh, the more complex the, the crop, but also exactly it's also harder. Can you name some of the challenges? You said there are so many wheels that you can turn where you can kind of jiggle the system. Can you name a few of those or explain a few of those? Yeah, so um, on the one, so one thing is that machine learning models we use, they at the moment, they still have a um, have a hard time to predict for things they have not seen at all. So for example, if the machine learning model is trained to predict for very wet climates, it probably can't predict for a very dry climate. So we have to figure out how much information we have to feed to the model so that it's able to, um, so it's basically a question of how many environments have to be covered by the training data. So how many, many environments actually do we need testing data for to be able to cover that environmental variation we will, which we will probably have in the future. That's one of the things. And then another question is, what is actually important to the plant? Which of the things that um, all together make up an environment like the soil, the um, weather, but also field management techniques. Um, are they irrigating their fields, things like that. You have to figure out which of those features are the important ones for the plant um, and which are influencing those um, the plants most um, because those are the ones that then carry the information for the machine learning model to say like, ah, okay, this plant performs you very well because I have a lot of rainfall in a certain time period, maybe even, we have to figure out how to exactly model these very complex interactions. What are the most important um, players in this interaction? Because those are the ones we have to keep and figure out which are not as important because those we could probably kick out because mm -hmm. they would maybe just create some noise to the model and make it perform worse. So those are very technical but very important things to look at for sure and uh, you said you need also need more or enough training data for to predict the yet unseen so that the yeah. model is able to predict what it hasn't otherwise seen how do you get that training data so um the training data is provided by the breeder they are already they already have some of their genetics which are is tested in the field um so, for example, some of our breeders, they are already phenotyping their varieties in fields for years. I mean, all of them are doing that, but some of them already have phenotype data for lines. They also have genotyped for years. Mm -hmm. And that really, that really helps. So all the training data comes from the breeder and it's very specific to their specific breeding program to the specific area they are breeding for, um, where the environment comes in, um, but also their specific genetics they have. So it's about their population, their goals, their genetics, and their target um, market basically also. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense uh, because obviously then you have the highest or the highest hit rate, the best advantage for the specific breeder that actually uses the technique. Yeah. But what I can't like, don't fully get yet is the aspect of that unseen. So if you're working with material, with training data from the breeders, that's already in the works, that's scenarios that are already happening. But how do you, how do you get that uh, 30 degree weather data or, or other kind of extreme data that you want to simulate that haven't happened yet, basically? Yeah. So actually, so I mean, a breeder could achieve that by testing in such extreme environments. I mean, we do already have regions in the world which feature those very extreme climates. Um, and we already saw breeders who had to throw away a whole year of testing because the weather was so off. Mm. And that's 
a lot of money going down the drain. Um, so the breeder basically has to pick the environments which are maybe close to what they are, they will have in the future. Mm -hmm. And then also include those in the testing, knowing, of course, that their varieties at the moment, which they are testing at the moment there, perform probably very bad. But this is valuable information for the model to train uh, and to understand the these extreme environments. So if I if I got that correctly, that's also part of what you do in that early strategy, kind of figuring out where you want to go to identify these scenarios and make sure that everyone that participates understands this is an investment that's way less than what you are likely going to lose if you don't if you don't yeah. test in these extreme climates, if you don't have that package to get the right training data to then uh, in the end implement the model. Right? Yeah, exactly. So we can look, for example, at the environments they have at the moment, how they are composed in terms of like their weather and soil and whatever composition, uh, and then even see like those two locations, they have very similar climates. So maybe focus on one of those and instead of the second location, choose another one, which is maybe a bit more extreme in another direction so mm -hmm. that you remove redundancies from your testing and rather spend your money on capturing all this environmental diversity you have already, but also the one you we will very likely move towards into the, in the future. I love that. We're big fans of strategy because like focus your, your resources and your energy strategically um, for best results. Yeah, exactly. So what would you say or where do you see the role for technology, this kind of technology, possibly, you know, the technology you're you're still developing in the future of plant breeding? So I think really technology in general is key because, I mean, we know the climate is changing so rapidly and there are efforts to stop the climate change. But I'm a bit pessimistic that we can stop it completely. So we will need, see some effects. Um, temperature will increase, we increase, we will have droughts. Um, also, diseases will travel, basically. Um, I mean, we already see in Germany that diseases from the southern part of Europe come um, to us and our plants are not prepared. So you have to accelerate your breeding. You have to, you have to breed for those climates. And technologies like machine learning actually make that possible to think about what will be in maybe 10 years when I'm able to sell my, my variety and then really to breed for that very targeted and including all this environmental information and including the interaction between your genetics and those environments to find those varieties which can then handle it. And that has to happen very quickly because I, I, I'm not completely on top of things. I don't know which temperature we expect in like Germany or in the US corn belt in 10 years, I guess it will be very hot. And plants, if plants adapt via evolution, it just takes very long. Even with um, um, classical breeding approaches take years. Um, so it has to be quicker. It has to be targeted towards that. And machine learning is the one thing, one of the things that can really help. That's uh, that's that's almost a great note to end on. But I have one final question um, because I think it's always great to, if you've gone into that field, if you're an expert, if you studied that, to go from basically what made you go into the field to where are you at right now? How does your work fit to your vision that you had of going into that into the field of of plant molecular biology, um, and and yeah, what what, oh. what say you? <laughs> Oh, that's actually a good question. So because I just stumbled stumbled into the plant field purely by kind of accident, I was back in the days when I was studying, I was just searching for a job at the university um, to support myself. Uh, and they were the ones who gave me the chance to do that and to stay with them for a very long time, continuously working um, in that field. And that's what made me very interested in generally in like generally in plants and how they do things how complex they are just because they have to stay at the location they were they sprouted basically they can't move away except a human comes and digs them up and puts them somewhere else so 
they are so complex creatures basically and that's so cool and now um i mean i can still apply the knowledge i gained back then because breeding is really trying to change something in this very complex system and figuring out how we have to change it to adapt to certain situations or i mean just increasing yield is in the climate we have at the moment is challenging um and it's a very complex thing so that's that's pretty cool that i can mix here my knowledge about plants and their molecular biology together with uh, bioinformatics like all the computer science stuff behind it uh, which can just handle all these massive data sets uh, we have so yeah Sounds like you're in the perfect place and quite happy. And for the audience out there, you can't see Patricia, but she's smiling from ear to ear as she tells us. So <laughs> maybe you can hear it. Um, Patricia, thank you so much for, for giving us some insight into your work, into the Exceed Score product. And I was especially fascinated by that process of how you work, how you basically co-create with breeders to go from strategy, from analyzing where they are, where they want to go to, to finding a strategy and then obviously applying the the tech applying the machine learning tech to figure out which which plants which variants um have the highest yield potential and possibly we also learned uh, that you're working on on ways to apply it to more crop than soy barley maize so more complex plants uh, so we have a lot to look forward to with exceed score and computomics thanks a lot for having me It was a it was a true joy um, for you out there. Uh, if you want to learn a little more, if you want to check out what Patricia told us, feel free to drop by our website, computomics.com. We will have show notes on this episode with links to uh, the relevant issues, as well as obviously show notes from the other episodes that you're happy and invited to listen to. And we hope to have you back for our next episode of the Computomics podcast. Mm -hmm.